Hello everybody, this is Tim here again uh, at Boomstick Critique. Uh, I just figured I would go ahead and jump into the Evil Dead films now instead of waiting too long. I want to hurry up and get them done before Halloween gets here. I'm going to make these reviews pretty short for each one of these movies because they're Evil Dead. I mean, everybody's seen these. Every, everybody pretty much has the same thoughts on them. So there's no reason for me to harp on these films longer than I need to. Because I'll just be saying the same stuff that everyone else has said. Yes, Bruce Campbell is great in the film. Um, his character evolution in the films from kind of a regular wimpy guy in the first film to a, a hero badass by the third film is really awesome. Um, just to jump into the first film here, I'll probably just do reviews for all the films in one video. But just to jump into the first film, it's directed by Sam Raimi, obviously. Um, if you haven't seen this film, check it out, definitely, if you're a horror fan. This film could have easily have been an over-the-top B movie just with lots of gore, but it, this movie excels so good uh, that it makes itself from an over-the-top B movie into an A-plus horror film, which it just Sam Raimi just does it fantastically here. To me, this well, I guess this is his first real director outing is this film, and he does a wonderful job here. I think the directing is better is is better in Evil Dead 2 than it is here. Uh, but this film just has a great look to it to me, like with the d directing of it, like with the fog and everything and the, the lighting and all that shit. This film just looks wonderful to me. I love the look of this film. Um, just jump into it. You got a basic story. You got a group of friends. They go to a cabin in the wood. <laughs> cabin in the woods. Um, they start playing this tape recorder. You got this guy named Scott who's like the second male lead after uh, Bruce Campbell's Ash. Um, he's kind of a dick in the movie. But uh, he's like a tougher guy than Bruce Campbell is, at least at first. Uh, so he, you kind of root for him as the hero at first. But there's there's like one scene where he's goofing off with a shotgun in his hand. He checks to make sure it ain't loaded. And then he like puts it in Bruce Campbell's face and starts laughing about it. And I'm, I'm like, oh, that's so funny. If it had been me, if my friend had did that, I'd be like, what the fuck's wrong with you? But anyway. But, but yeah, this, this is still an A-plus horror film. I'll go ahead and already say it. Four stars out of four. This is a great movie. Definitely recommend it, and definitely you should check it out. Um, one thing I always find people often overlook with this film is there are little bits and like little spices of humor in this one as well. Not nowhere near as much as two and three, especially not th especially not as much as three, but they are there. Um, like when something like like when one of the deadites is killed and it falls down on the ground and blood splashes out of it and hits Bruce Campbell directly in the face and he's like, "Oh my God!" He's like so over the top. Um, <laughs> Just the way he says it. That's that's humor right there. A plus humor. That's wonderful. That's hilarious. Um, one thing I found kind of a little bit too silly for me in the movie is when Bruce Campbell's girlfriend like gets her head chopped off by the shovel and her body's like laying on top of him and she starts acting, starts doing like a humping motion and all at once blood squirts out of the neck wound like all over his face. That was a little bit too silly, too silly played in this movie for me for a movie that's going for more of a straight up vibe of horror but lets the comedy flow from like the over the topness of the gore and like the the killings and attacks and everything that was a bit too silly for me that scene was the the humping corpse though was disturbing I'll, I'll say that um so they play this tape recorder at the cabin it's like a demon incantation uh you got the necronomicon the book of the dead there uh which looks cool um and it talks about like there's this demon or whatever that uh, you play this incantation, it gets a license to possess living people. Uh, it comes to life in the woods, and you got this wonderful, like, cool, like, thing where the camera's moving, and it's obviously like the POV of the demon, and it's like going through the woods and shit. That's really awesome. Um, I like how when the film first starts out, and it's like really quiet, and you just get the title "The Evil Dead" pops up, and then the sound kicks in. I love that. Um, so they're at the cabin, the demon comes alive, uh, Ash's sister in the movie Cheryl, who they never touch upon in part two or three. You think Ash would like really miss his sister, but she's like really glossed over in the other two movies like her character is. Uh, but she's fine here. Um, and I, I thought it was interesting that Ash like has a, has a sister, so she's never talked about in the other two movies. But anyway... You, get, you do get some stupid stuff in the movie, like standard old school horror cliches, like she hears a, Ash's sister hears a noise outside, her name is Cheryl, the character's name is Cheryl, she hears a noise outside, of course she goes outside to investigate, and then you get the most famous scene in the movie, she gets a, 
a rape by trees, which I don't really think even demon possessed trees can actually rape anybody. It's more like she gets violated by them. The branches start scratching her and they pull her legs open, and the fucking tree branch like shoots between her legs. <laughs> it's more like she just gets violated by the trees instead of rape. I don't really think a tree can actually rape anybody, regardless of whether it's possessed or not, but. It's still a pretty fucked up scene and definitely a hardcore. I think Sam Raimi has balls for putting that in the movie. Um, so you get that. Um, she ends up being possessed, and you get like this really cool scene where she, uh, where like uh, Ash's girlfriend Linda is like trying to guess what uh, what cards uh, Scott's girlfriend is holding, and she just keeps getting them wrong. But Scott's girlfriend keeps pretending like she gets them right, and all at once Cheryl starts going. Jack of Spades, Jack of Clubs, something like that. She fucking like jerks around and she's possessed and starts starts fucking floating in the air. I bet people when they watch this for the first time back in the day probably shit themselves. Uh, I don't blame them. This would have probably been scary as fuck for me if I would have seen it as like a little kid. I saw it more as like like a 13 or 14 year old, so it wasn't as hard for me to digest then. Plus, I'd already seen a lots of horror movies before then. But uh, but I say it was pretty fucking intense for back in the day. Um, she's possessed, she starts attacking them all, they throw her in the cellar. Another little weak thing about the film is the fact that it was made so long ago. Uh, one or, about two little effect shots don't hold up today. Um, but the film has charm, though, really powerful horror movie, old school charm, that overcomes any weak effects. Um, like when uh, Cheryl gets thrown into the, the, the fucking uh, cellar, and uh, Scott starts hitting her in the face with an axe, and you can easily tell it's a dummy. Um, that's one little weak scene. Uh, not too bad. Not a big deal. Uh, they manage to lock her in the cellar, and she becomes the scariest fucking thing in the movie, in my opinion. Her in the cellar is the scariest damn thing in this whole fucking movie, in my opinion. Because uh, she keeps fucking with everybody. She like looks at Ash, and she's like, "Soon you'll be like me, and then and and then you'll be locked in the cellar." <laughs> that was fucking scary. Uh, Ash's girlfriend gets like stabbed in the fucking ankle or whatever, or the Achilles heel by Cheryl. And it's a fucking brutal scene. Uh, and then Ash goes to check on her, and there's like this little spiderweb design starts appearing on her, her ankle and all over her leg or whatever. She's possessed now, and you get like the creepy scene where she's like looking at Ash, saying stuff like, We're gonna get you, not another peep, time to go to sleep. Uh, that was really cool. Ash's girlfriend, when she's possessed, though, kind of looks like a drag queen in some shots to me. Because <laughs> of her makeup on her face. But uh, I, that's kind of funny. And then he like, you get this really creepy fucking scene where Ash drags his possessed girlfriend out into the outside, outside in front of the house and just leaves her laying there and, and she's like screaming like, uh, first he will come for him and then he will come for you. Uh, it's pretty fucked up. The lighting and stuff on her face gives her a real wit, uh, real, uh, witch quality to her, to the, to her look. It looks cool. Looks really awesome. Um, fucking, uh, Scott's girlfriend, she gets possessed too and you get this... Stupid shit where Bruce Campbell keeps getting knocked into like this little puny shelf that I could probably literally lift up two fingers. It hardly has anything on it that he should be able to easily lift up, but he can't move it. He even talks about it in the commentary about how funny it is that he can't, or something like he can't even, how funny it is his character can't move that shelf and there's like barely anything holding him down. Oh, that was funny. He talks about how his character is like has a weakness towards shelves or has a problem with shelves or something like that. That's funny as fuck. Uh, and I agree, there's no way this shelf's, uh, shelf should be able to fucking hold him down. But uh, that's another little weak gripe. But all of that little... There's, what I'm, the little gripes about this film are so small and minimal. They're just so little weak things. Um, they just get so overshadowed by the pure fun of just like the over-the-top gore in this film. And just the fun of the attacks and stuff. And the, just the craziness of the movie. that <laughs> just elevates it up to an A-class horror film. Um... But fucking, um, yeah, uh, Scott chops up his girlfriend. Uh, she's, she's dead. Another, one, another creepy thing I love in this film is that when, like, uh, Scott throws his girlfriend into the fire and he pulls her out. This is right before he chops her up. And she starts, uh, she starts looking at him and saying, oh, thank you for pulling me off of those flames. Uh, <laughs> my, pr my pretty flesh, uh, thank you for not letting my pretty fr uh, flesh burn on those hot coals or. Something like that. And she's like, you have pretty skin. Give it to us. <laughs> I love that fucked up shit in this movie. Um, so she gets chopped up. She's killed. Um, oh, there's one, one scene where Ash's girlfriend is possessed. And Ash starts like slapping the shit out of her. Because she won't stop like aggravating him. I thought that was hilarious. Um, 
Ash manages to chop her head off. Uh, then you get that fucking like headless corpse hump scene for a second that I was talking about from the, from a while ago. Uh, but he manages to get her body off of him. And then fucking Scott gets attacked by the trees out in the forest because he says, fuck this shit, I'm leaving. And I love it right before he leaves, uh, Ash is like, uh, uh, we can't take Linda, her ankles hurt, she can't move. And he's like, and Scott, Scott looks at Bruce Campbell and he's like, I mean, he looks at Ash and he's like, uh, she's your girlfriend, you take care of her. I, I love that because he's like, I don't give a fuck about her, let's get out of here. <laughs> and if you're not coming, fuck you too. Uh, I just think that shit's funny. But uh, he gets attacked by the trees, eventually uh, he gets possessed. And then it's pretty much Ash versus Cheryl, who's managed to escape from the cellar. You also get, like, this really crazy stuff for the Force or whatever from the woods. The demon is, like, fucking with Ash. And, uh, like, this record player comes on. A light bulb fills, fills up with blood and shit. And he, Ash, like, touches a, a mirror and it turns into water. That was really cool. Stuff like that is really cool. That really elevates this film and helps elevate it. Um, one thing leads to another. It's Ash versus the last two, which is his friend Scott turned into a demon now. Uh, or possessed by one or whatever. A dead eye, I would say. Ash versus Scott and uh, versus uh, Cheryl. Um, he fucking uh, gouges Scott's eyes out, which is pr pretty cool and extremely gory and graphic scene. Um, he man uh, Cheryl manages to make it in there. Um, Ash's leg gets like clawed all the fucking pieces. And it looks really painful. He man he falls down. He takes the book of the dead. He decides to burn it in the fire. Cheryl's beating him with the poker. He's having a hard time getting it in there. He uses this necklace that uh, he he gave Linda as a present earlier in the film. He uses it to hook the book of the dead and then sling it into the fire. Uh, it burns up, and then you get like this really crazy fucking scene where these like demon hands burst out of uh out of Scott and out of uh Cheryl, and they're like f fucking like blood's flying everywhere and hits Bruce Campbell right in the face. It's hilarious. Um. And then, uh, like, their bodies start fucking disintegrating in, like, this kind of stop-motion effect or whatever. Uh, it's old school, but it, it's really cool, and it adds a lot of charm to the film. I still think it looks better than CGI. Fuck CGI up its ass. Um, and then they both, like, disintegrate, and there's, like, the two deadites disintegrate, and there's, like, these fucking cockroaches crawling out of their uh, clothes and shit. It's really fucked up. And the sun's up, and Ash is like, you know, the, it's great because it's over, and the sun's up. Uh, and one thing that's really kind of neat is when the Book of the Dead is, like, burning up in the flames, like, right before, um, like, a, it's got a fucking creepy tongue that starts coming out of its mouth. The Book of the Dead does as it's burning. It's, like, got a tongue coming out of its mouth. That was fucked up, uh, and I like the effect. But, uh, anyway, back to what I was saying. Um, so the sun's coming up, and the ash is, like, you know, they, you know, it's saved. Everything's back to normal. Um, but then all at once, the fucking, like, camera starts moving again from the evil entity's point of view, um, uh, out in the woods, and it starts charging, and it, like, breaks through the house, and then goes directly towards, uh, Ash, and he, like, turns around, looks straight at the camera, and Bruce Campbell, like, looks right at the camera and goes, ah, and then it just, like, goes off. Uh, that's just hilarious, just his reaction to when the force attacks him at the end. Uh, like I said, this film does have little bits and pieces of comedy, but it's, like, really minimal. And it kind of comes from just like the craziness of the situation rather than them trying to deliberately make the situation more more Three stooges this goofy like they do in the other two movies, which works out well in the second one. But I think they pushed it too far in the third one, in my opinion, or more or too far. Well, in my opinion, I think the third one has too much comedy. I really do. I think they pushed the comedy too far in, in Army of Darkness, but it's still a great movie. But I do think they pushed the comedy too far in that one. Or at least to, to way too much of a goofy level. The comedy is very minimal and sprinkled in this film. And just comes from the the ridiculous <laughs> over the topness of the situation. Rather than deliberately trying to make comedy out of the situation. Like the, the second and third one does. But anyway. Even though the second and third one do it good. In my opinion. I, I love all three of these films. And yes I'm going to review the remake too. We'll get to that when we get there. But anyway, as far as this film goes, Bruce Campbell's great. The other actors, they're fine. Um, the guy plays Scott. He's he's good. He's fine. Um, Sam Raimi does a good job directing. The film is great. It's a must-see for horror fans. It's easily a four-star film. It's one of my favorite horror films of all time. Um, and I highly recommend this film. And uh, there's going to be a little jump cut here. And I'll snap right back at you guys with Evil Dead 2. Hello everybody, this is Tim here again at Boomstick Critique. 
uh, decided to do this video a little bit different because my stupid ass uh, computer keeps messing up. <laughs> but anyway, just to jump into this one. This video is going to be even shorter than the last one. I decided to just go ahead and add these two together. I'm well, actually, I'm going to do a one video, one video that covers the whole franchise, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, but just to jump into Evil Dead 2. There's a lot of confusion about this film, or whether or not it's a remake or a sequel. Uh, but Sam Raimi has went on record saying the film is actually a sequel and that he shot the recap at the beginning because he couldn't get rights to the footage of the original, uh, which makes sense. Um, just jump into the film. This is the best film of the three films, in my opinion. Uh, this film is more entertaining than the first one. Uh, I prefer the more grimy, grim look of the first one, though, over the more slightly polished look of this one. Um, but this film is more fun and more entertaining, though, and just more enjoyable to watch. And just has more going for it. Any weak spots in the film? Um, well, just start off with the good things first. The good things of the film. I love the fact that most of the film in this one you get Bruce Campbell by himself as Ash in the cabin. Uh, his dead girlfriend's body comes back to life and starts dancing like a ballerina. That is awesome and fantastic and wonderful. Um, and uh, when he gets his hand possessed, the stuff that Bruce Campbell does with his hand as the character of Ash is amazing. He even flips himself over, starts hitting himself like on top of the head with plates and shit. That's amazing. And I love it when uh, Ash chainsaws off his own hand and Bruce Campbell's like, uh, who's laughing now? <laughs> that's amazing. That's wonderful. Uh, that's great work by Bruce Campbell and great writing by uh, Sam Raimi. Uh, any weak points in the film? Um, the pacing gets a, uh, gets a little bit worse when the new characters come along. The... We get Annie in this film, who is the professor's niece, the guy who owns the cabin's niece, or used to own the cabin, the guy who discovered the Book of the Dead, that is. Um, and you get her friends, and these two, well, her friend, uh, named, uh, this, like, guy who, like, has a crush on her, I think, and, uh, and then these two hillbillies. Uh, the pacing goes down a little bit when they show up. Um, but, um, pretty much, yeah, this film is just so highly entertaining and enjoyable, I can't stress that enough. You get Henrietta in this movie, which is like uh, the professor who owned the cabin's ex, uh, well, his wife, not his ex-wife, but his wife. I guess she might as well be his ex-wife now that she's demon-possessed. But his wife, and she comes up in the fruit cellar and starts coming after Bruce Campbell, and she gets that great line. The, uh, or her character's, uh, well, her character's a she, but she's actually played by Ted Raimi, which is, which is wonderful. And Ted Raimi's uh, Sam Raimi's brother. Uh, but you get that great line, there's someone in my fruit cellar, someone with a fresh soul. Uh, that's, that's wonderful. Um, you get great scenes in the film and Bruce Campbell's running from the force, uh, as well. And he's like going through the cabin and it's like chasing him through different parts of the cabin and then it can't find him and you get like this backtrack shot where it goes all the way back into the woods and the camera like follows it all the way. Uh, and uh, like you get, I mean, you get the POV like all the way through the woods and it's like awesomely done and directed. Um, uh, any other, any other highlights? Um. Oh, uh, when the, the, like, the, the place is just, like, starts screwing with Bruce Campbell, uh, and then, like, everything in the, the cabin comes to life, and the deer head starts laughing, everything in the cabin starts laughing, and then Bruce Campbell looks directly at the camera, and he starts laughing, that is wonderful, that is hysterical, without a doubt, um, that's a great highlight, uh, it shows how he's starting to lose his own mind, um, you get, uh, the new characters show up eventually, the pacing goes down a little bit, um, there's this character of Bobby Joe, who's this actually a pretty hot girl, but she chews back her, which is kind of a turn off for me, um, no matter how hot she is, but she gets attacked by the, by the woods, because she runs outside like a dummy, because she gets scared, um, the forest attacks her, drags her directly in, uh, to this, uh, like, drags her, like, felt like 100 miles per hour directly into this tree right in the middle of the forest, great scene, you don't get to see the impact, but you do feel it from the way, just the way it's shot, you do feel it. Um, but that was cool, and then you got the, the stupid hillbilly guy who forces him to go outside to look for his obviously dead girlfriend, uh, who was killed by the woods. Um, he gets killed when he, when Annie accidentally stabs him thinking that he's the possessed Ash because Ash gets possessed in the movie. Um, and she lays him down on the ground in front of the uh, cellar, and Henrietta comes up out of it and drags him into it, and this ocean wave of blood shoots out. It's a really awesome scene, uh, definite highlight. Uh, one other little nitpick for me is like when Ash's hand, after he cuts it off, it's running around, it's messing with him, and it gives him the finger. Uh, it's, that's a little bit too whimsical for me, a little bit too silly. Uh, but other than that, there's no, I don't really have any complaints in this film at all. Uh, if you prefer like 
straight up scariness. Uh, you probably you might like the first. You you'll probably like the first movie better than this one. I do agree that the first film is scarier than this one, but I do agree that this film is better directed and more enjoyable to watch than 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 the first one in my opinion. Um, Bruce Campbell just carries this film. Um, uh, Annie's friend gets possessed. Uh, this is another highlight. I love it when Annie's friend gets possessed. I also find it funny that he's like floating in the air and he starts like reciting the tagline of the movie, uh, Dead by Dawn, which is the title of this sequel. Um, well, the, the, not really the tagline, but the, the sequel title, I should say, is what he recites. But it's still funny out of the way and I love it. Uh, Ash comes in there and chops him out of hell with an axe. And like as he's dying, you uh, you hear like the creature talking, we live, we live still. I love that. That's great. Um, uh, pretty much one thing leads to another. Ash manages to become unpossessed when he finds his uh, necklace that he gave his girlfriend in the last movie, which snaps him back to his humanity. Um, and uh, oh, I can't forget this. I love this as well. Uh, and he starts uh, swinging the axe at him, uh, and he keeps saying, I'm all right. And finally, he grabs her and goes, I'm all right. Are you listening to me? Do you hear what I'm saying? I said, I'm all right. <laughs> I love that. And she's like, yeah, you're all right now, but for how long? So eventually, they have to kill Henrietta. Uh, it's a great fight scene. Bruce Campbell's character, Ash, becomes the hero in this film that he's known for. Uh, it's really cool. He chops off the end of his shotgun with a, uh, with a chainsaw, and he says, groovy. Awesome one-liner in what the character's known for. Um, he goes in there and does, well, he goes back into the cabin, does battle, battle with Henrietta. Her head grows, uh, starts growing into this big elongated monster. It keeps saying, I'll swallow your soul, I'll swallow your soul. He chops her head off with a chainsaw, puts the double barrel shotgun down at it. And so uh, it keeps saying, I'll swallow your soul. He blows the head to pieces. Uh, and he, right before he does it, he says, uh, Bruce Campbell says, swallow this. I love that line. That's great. It's a wonderful fight scene. Very fun. Um, one thing leads to another. Uh, they, they found the Annie has found these two missing pages from the Book of the Dead. She recites one of them that causes the spirit of the forest to uh, make itself into the flesh, and she's going to recite the other one, which will make a time rip to send the creature um, back to the past. Uh, and as she's reciting the second page, she gets stabbed in the back by Ash's hand. If you're watching this film for the first time, I really you'd probably be surprised that she dies. But as she's dying, she recites the second page. Uh, the creature's in the flesh, it grabs Ash, and it's got like all these heads of the people that's died on it, and uh, it's got like a new one on it, which is Ash's head, I guess because the creature expects him to die, and like Ash's head pops up out of the creature and goes, victory is ours, <laughs> and then Bruce Campbell rams the friggin' chainsaw into the creature, uh, just blood squirts all out, squirts out everywhere, all out of the creature's eye, the time rift opens up because Annie was still reciting it even after she was dying, uh, it swallows the creature whole, uh, and, and uh, you think it's over. Uh, Ash thinks it's over. And then the, the time rift is still going. It won't stop. It swallows Bruce Campbell into it. Or, or the character of Ash, if you prefer to call him, whichever. Um, he gets swallowed into it. And he gets sent back to the past. And he blows a dead eye's head off, one that's flying. And then everybody there, the knights and everybody, start saying, Hail to he who has come to deliver us from the terrors of the deadites. I love this ending. I like this ending better than the first one. It's more epic and definitely, more, and definitely funnier to me. Uh, another, th another joke I loved in the movie is when they're looking at the missing pages, Annie and, uh, Ash are looking at them, and it's got a picture of, obviously, uh, of, obviously, Ash, um, and Annie, and he, Ash says, who's that? And Annie says, this is the guy who fell from the sky, who was prophesied to have destroyed the evil, and it's obviously a picture of Ash, and then Ash himself goes, well, he didn't do a very good job, did he? I thought that was hilarious, because obviously, obviously an in-joke about the, the character himself. Made by the character himself. I love that. thought that was hilarious. This is easily a four star out of four film. I only had minor nitpick gripes at it. Uh, with the slight pacing going down after the new characters show up. And uh, the hand joke where it gives Ash the finger. That's pretty much it. That's pretty much the only gripes I have with this film. Uh, other than that, any other gripes? Well, the recap at the beginning could probably be a little confusing to, uh, to people who watched the film for the first time after seeing the first film who don't know the backstory of the fact that Sam Raimi couldn't get the footage to the first one and had to film a recap. That could be a little uh, confusing to people. Uh, they really could have like easily have just started the film off uh, with a voiceover of somebody explaining what happened uh, and then just cut to Ash Flink getting flung through the, flung through the woods. Um, but, um, well... And just cut the ash being flung through the woods like uh, like uh, where the first film ended and like where this film pretty much picks up and becomes a sequel. It has the recap at the beginning, but then uh, it cuts straight to pretty much the ending of the first film or, and then uh, cuts to ash getting flung through the woods by the force. Uh, 
it it it, it becomes a sequel directly from right there then on. Uh, but yeah, the recap could be a little confusing to newcomers who don't know the backstory of the film. But yeah, all in all, other than that, this film is a total four-star film. It's my favorite of the three. I think it's definitely the most entertaining and the most fun. It doesn't go overboard with the comedy like Part 3 does to me. I still love Part 3. Armory Darkness is great, but I feel like Armory Darkness goes overboard with the comedy uh, a little bit too much. Uh, but this film, in my opinion, is, uh, is definitely the most solid. Uh, written and just the most solid film of the three films. I highly recommend this film and uh, I'll see you guys right here in a few seconds with Army of Darkness. Hello everybody, this is Tim here again uh, with Boomstick Critique. Here is my last uh, Evil, Dead Evil Dead film review well, of the trilogy, not counting the remake. Uh, but anyway, to start off, for uh, my review for Army of Darkness, it's a four star film out of four. Out of four. I just got done watching it. It's still a wonderful film. Still holds up after all these years. I would say this one's probably my second favorite after the after the second one. I think this one, uh, uh, just to start off with the story, Ash gets transported back in time. Once again, this won't be a very super long review because these films have been reviewed to death, so there's no reason for me to harp on things that everybody else already ha has harped on or has said. But anyway, just cut long story short, Ash goes back in time uh, from where, he, where we left off at the end of the second movie, although the beginning of this one retcons the ending of the last one just like uh, kind of like the second one did to uh, the ending of the first film. <clears throat> but anyway, so now instead of Ash being a hero, Ash is like uh, made into uh, is made into a slave. They drop him uh, one thing leads to another. They throw him down in this pit, uh, and it's like got this witch in it. You get to see Bruce Campbell do battle with this witch like creature. He cuts it all to pieces with his chainsaw. It's really cool. He manages to make it back up out of the pit. Um, you get wonderful lines like where uh, Ash is like, and the next uh, one of you that even touches me, and he like jerks out his boomstick. Um, and you get other wonderful lines where he's like, all right, who wants some, who wants a little? And he points at this guy and he's like, you, <laughs> I love that. And it's like the guy's been whipping him the whole time through the movie. Uh, that's great. Um, and then one thing that's kind of funny is Ash goes down into the pit without his boomstick and he comes up out of the pit with his boomstick and it never explains where it came from. That's a little thing. Um, so Ash is like. After he makes it out of the pit, he's pretty much proclaimed the hero of the land. And they think he's the chosen one. And they want him to whoop the dead out's ass and bring peace to the land or whatever. And they send him on like a quest to find the book so he can um, save the land and send himself uh, back to his own time period. He falls in love with this girl there named Sheila. Uh, I believe the actress's name is M. Beth Davids. Uh, she's good looking. Nothing really wrong with the look department there. but uh, I believe it's the same woman from uh, Matilda. But anyway, she's fine. Uh, they seem to fall in love really quickly, though, uh, which I find funny. Uh, Bruce Campbell pretty much just grabs her and says, give me some sugar, baby. But it's so funny. It's kind of almost like a James Bond movie, how James Bond always gets the girl. Um, this movie is, like, just wonderful. This is not a horror film. It's not. It's more of an action-adventure uh, fantasy comedy, really, than it is a, a horror film. Uh, there's not really any horror in this film at all, to be honest. Um... I'd even say little kids could probably watch this. I'd say little kids could definitely watch this, honestly. But, uh, so Ash goes on a quest for the book. He gets uh, chased by the dark force, uh, I mean the dark uh, spirit or whatever from the woods. He gets chased by it in one scene in the whole movie. It's pretty much that thing's only appearance in this film. This film uh, definitely does not feel like the same type of movie as the last two. And to be honest, I kind of missed the cabin a little bit in this one. But three movies with the cabin, I do agree, would have been too much. Um... But uh, he get he gets away from the the the, the dark spirit of the woods, makes it to like this uh, fucking windmill, and uh, here you get this really goofy scene. There's a bunch of little mini ashes show up, uh, and they like ram a, uh, a fork in his ass. So that's a little bit too goofy for me. Anytime it's comedy about somebody getting rammed in the ass with something, that all that's always too goofy for me. But I do I do love the the rest of the stuff that happens though. When Bruce Campbell's getting ready to step on one of them, and he keeps saying London Bridge is falling down. And one of them drugs out a, uh, a nail and stabs it in his foot. And all the rest of the little uh, little ashes go, my fair lady. I, I love that. That's hilarious. Uh, they end up tying him down. They drop one of them into his mouth and he swallows him. And you got like this crazy scene where he like starts trying to come out of uh, Bruce Campbell's body. And you got two Bruce Campbells or two ashes if you prefer uh, stuck to each other. 
and they end up breaking apart, and the 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 evil one keeps saying, "You're good, Ash. I'm bad, Ash. You're goody little two shoes." And every time he keeps saying that, he keeps like fucking punching Ash in the face. I love that. That's hilarious. Um, and then Bruce Campbell like blows the and then add the good Ash blows the evil Ash's brains out, and then you get the great line, "Good, the bad. I'm the guy with the gun." That's wonderful. That's a great line. Um, then he he cuts him up into pieces, and then as he's burying him, I love this. As he's burying the the evil Ash, he says, "Hey, you got something on your face?" And he throws some and in the, in the he throws some dirt down there on his face. I love that. That's hilarious. Um, one thing leads to another. Ash makes it to the graveyard. Uh, he starts trying to. He there's three books. He has to figure out which one is the right book. And you get some comedy ensues basically as he picks the wrong books first, obviously. Uh, and then. He has to recite the words Klaatu, Verata, Nictu, the the words from uh, the original day the earth stood still, which I love that. That's that's hilarious. Um, he manages to get the book finally, but he doesn't recite the words correctly, and so a bunch of skeletons come to life. Basically, an army of the dead does. Um, you get like slapstick comedy ensues where the skeletons keep like punching him in the face and stuff. And well, like I said, my own little gripes with this movie is that the comedy sometimes is too much. Like when uh, all at once Bruce Campbell's just like laying there on the ground and all these skeleton hands pop out from every single direction and punch him in the face and from every single direction. That's a little bit too much for me, but he manages to make it out of there and I love this when Ash gets back. Uh, they're like, hey, you made it. You're, you're the hero. You made it. And he like looks at one of the guys and says, hey, get the fuck out of my face. I love that. That's hilarious. Um, but uh, they realize he messed up. Uh, she, he doesn't want to stay there and help him, though. He just wants to get the hell out of there. The army of the dead is there. Ash don't want no part of helping him uh, at first. But then Sheila gets kidnapped, and she gets transformed into a dead eye. Um, and so Bad Ash is brought back to life, and now he's the leader of the dead eye army. And so one thing leads to another, and Ash decides to take charge. He's tired of running, and he wants to take charge, whoop dead eye ass, and call it a day. So he decides to lead the, the people. Uh, against the Deadites, and basically the movie pretty much becomes like a war movie, like the humans versus the Deadites, humans versus skeletons, basically. And they all get into a battle, and you got wonderful, hilarious battle sequences here, like where one of the skeletons is crawling towards Ash, and he's like, I'll cut your gizzard out, and then Ash cuts this rope and flies up in the air, and then the skeleton's like, hey, where'd he go? And all at once, these big, this big thing of rocks falls down on top of it and squishes it. I love that, and I love how like random skeletons keep popping out and punching Ash in the face and shit. That's hilarious. Um, of course, Ash has to end up doing battle with, uh, the Deadite version of himself. Um, and then the, the fight is fun. You get Ash, like, with two swords fighting one, fighting evil Ash and another Deadite at the same, another Deadite at the same time. That's wonderful. Um, the humans are, are basically holding their own, holding their own, uh, and, uh, pretty much they're winning. Um, Ash is whooping ass and taking names. You got this wonderful scene where Ash is, like, souped up his car into some kind of like a futuristic mobile and he's driving through the land and like wiping out skeletons one by one. Uh, that's cool. He wrecks the car though when he sees Sheila standing there. Um, one thing I find funny is Sheila like looks at that, looks at Ash and says, you found me beautiful once. And he's like, honey, you got real ugly. And he stabs the hell out of her and flips her over top of the castle. Uh, <laughs> that's great. One thing that doesn't actually add up though is that after everything's over with, somehow she turns back to normal after the fall and becomes human again. I don't really get that. That doesn't make much sense to me. Um, that's not really explained, but it's a minor drop. But anyway, uh, you got the battle with Evil Ash versus Good Ash. He ends up setting the Evil One on fire, and he turns uh, completely into a skeleton. And then you got more humor that's too over the top for me, where he like punches the skeleton in the face. His head keeps spinning around, and he keep and he's the the skeleton's head keeps spinning around. And it keeps going whoa 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 whoa. That's that's a little bit too much too over the top for me. That's a little bit too much. Um. Uh, but it is funny. I mean, it is. Another thing I love is like uh, the skeleton winds up on top of this catapult, and he's like, "I have the book. I command the army." And then uh, Bruce, then Ash goes, "Buckle up, bonehead. You're in for a ride." And he cuts the rope, and the friggin' skeleton goes flying in the air and explodes. Uh, I love that. That's that's hilarious. Of course, he uh, drinks the potion, says the magic words, heads back to his own time. But of course, he didn't say it completely correctly again and messes up again. And so when he goes to the future, there's actually a dead out there, and it's like a witch. And uh, I love this, where she's like, uh, I'll swallow your soul. And Ash goes, come get some. I love that. And you get this really fun action scene where Bruce Campbell's, like, shooting the shit out of the witch. And the witch is, like, flying through the air, and he's blowing the hell out of it at the same time. I love that. That's really entertaining. Um, 
and he's uh, you get uh, really fun action. And I love how he's like a. Uh, I love how the witch when she first sees him is like, "Who the hell are you?" And Ash goes, "Name's Ash Housewares." I love that. That's hilarious. Um, and one uh, after he blows the hell out of the witch, there's this girl there, and he grabs her and says, "Uh, hell to the king, baby," and kisses her. And that's pretty much that's the end of the movie. It's a great ending, a uh, wonderful ending to the trilogy. This is my second favorite of the three because it's just so entertaining and so much fun. I just feel like the comedy some sometimes is pushed too much over the top. But other than that, this film is highly entertaining. Uh, and very wonderful to watch, and definitely this movie pretty much for me cemented Bruce Campbell as horror hero, uh, just with this movie alone. If not with the second movie, if that didn't convince you, then I guarantee this one will. Uh, if you're a horror movie fan, I say check out all three of these. I'll see you guys again with a review for the remake. Uh, this is a wonderful film. Um, do I think we should ever get an Evil Dead 4? Um... I think it would be a blast to have an Evil Dead 4. I do think, though, that this film wraps it up the wraps up the story perfectly. Um, and I do think if you had an Evil Dead 4, you would have to do something different. Uh, I know the original ending to this film was Ash waking up in the future and it's been like the apocalypse or whatever. You could do a movie that takes place with that ending and have Ash in the future fighting like Deadites, but like futuristic Deadites. It could be like a sci-fi film mixed with a horror, kind of like how this film is like a fantasy film, adventure film. You could do that. Or you could do a film that takes place with the regular ending and have, like, where Ash didn't say the words right once again. He's fighting deadites in, like, his hometown or whatever, or, like, all around town. You could do that. That would be cool. Either one of those ideas would be cool. You could do an Evil Dead 4, but um, this film does end the trilogy on a high note and does wrap the story up pretty much. But you could do a 4. I would love to see a 4, personally, as long as it's Sam Raimi back again. But he's, like, so much into the big budget world now with the Spider-Man films and all that kind of stuff that I don't even know if he'd want to come back and do a part four. But, um, and I really think it'd be easy to do an Evil Dead 4. I honestly do. Um, some people might say, well, Bruce Campbell might be too old or something, but it doesn't matter what age Bruce Campbell is. We're going to enjoy seeing him no matter what, so it doesn't make no difference. Uh, and as a matter of fact, his age could be like a joke in the movie that could lead to even more comedy of having an old Ash, like, getting the hell beat out of him all the time and him having to figure out ways to fight back, even at his age. That could be a lot of laughs, but, um, but anyway, and the, as for the rumor about an Evil Dead TV series, I don't really know how you could do an Evil Dead TV series, I don't even think you could, maybe an Evil Dead miniseries, uh, maybe like a miniseries, instead of getting a fourth movie, maybe they just turned it into a miniseries with Bruce Campbell as the star, that would be cool as well, I would, I would enjoy that as well, but as far as it goes now, for these three movies, I feel that they complete each other really well, and this movie's the obvious evolution of the other two, um, and, um, it's a great film, and I highly recommend you check it out, so, once again, this is a four-star film, and this is three four-star reviews in a row, so, highly recommend this trilogy, and there will be a little cut here, and I'll see you guys again with the remake. Hello, everybody, this is Tim here again with my final Evil Dead review. Well, if I can get it. Let's jump in here with the remake. A new vision from the producers of the original classic. For anybody that's wondering, special features, uh, making life difficult, the intense and physically exhausting creation of the film, uh, directing the dead, director Feed uh, Alvarez, I think that's how you said this guy's name, reimagines a cult horror classic, and then Being Mia, the, psych the physical and psychological transformation into evil Mia. Okay, this is a remake. Is this remake needed, first of all? No, this remake is not needed. If you didn't want to make a part four, you could have easily have released the original film back in the theaters. There's no reason to do a remake of this film, but since we have a remake of this film, let's discuss it. Okay, no reason for it to exist, but the fact that it does exist, let's jump into it. Okay, this film, we start off, it's pretty much the same setup as the original film. Got a group of people that go to a cabin, except in this one, it's like a brother and sister. is kind of like the main uh, drama theme for this one. And the sister is like a, a drug addict because her mom was like in an insane asylum. She started going crazy, and she was dying, and her brother abandoned her because he couldn't face it. Um, and so she turned into turned, in, turned to drugs because of that. And she's recovering from the drugs. Um, and they're wanting to keep her there and force her to give up drugs permanently, make her go cold turkey. Um, and you find out that she OD'd once before, and so they're going to force her to stay there at the cabin no matter what. 
Um, the guy acting wise, the girl who plays Mia, she's the best acting wise in the film. The guy who plays the brother, he's all right, but he's a little dull sometimes. I didn't mind the um, but well, the guy who plays the brother, he's dull sometimes, but he tries. You can tell the guy's trying. Uh, the guy who plays like the geeky guy with glasses in here, who discovers the book of the dead down in the the cellar. Um, his character annoyed the hell out of me at first because he's reading through the book of the dead, and all through the book it says, "Do not read, burn this, don't read it, don't read it." And he still reads it. That's really friggin' stupid. That's unforgivable. But through the movie, his character keeps having the hell beat out of him, but he keeps fighting back nonstop, even though he keeps getting beat up worse and worse. So I warmed up to him after a while. You got this other girl who is kind of like an ex-girlfriend of the uh, of the brother in the movie. She's just kind of okay. And then uh, the um, and then you got like the girlfriend of the brother now. She's just kind of there. She's I think, honestly, she's the weakest of acting-wise, but her part is also the least interesting out of all the characters, so she didn't have much to really chew on. But, um, anyway, things about this film, um, it keeps you guessing about who's going to be the Ash equivalent in this movie. There's not really an Ash character in this movie, but what character is going to be the equivalent of Ash in this film, and the film keeps you guessing on that. Um... Pretty much the geeky guy with the glasses reads the book. The creature in the woods awakens. Um, the, um, the Mia starts having a relapse. She wants to get the hell out of there. Um, she, he um, she heads out of there. Well, she starts freaking out because she can't handle going cold turkey, basically. And she tries to get the hell out of there. Um, she runs into the creature in the woods. She gets uh, cut all to pieces by these like thorn bush or whatever. And this like slug creature crawls up between her legs. It's okay, not as impactful as the tree rape or tree violation from the original, but okay. Um, you got a dog in the movie, and pretty much almost any horror movie when a dog shows up, automatically you know the dog's going to die. It's like the brother's dog, and you know the dog's going to die, and the dog does die. Mia kills it with a hammer. Um, you don't see it happen, but you see it like in a flashback where she was beating it with a hammer. Uh, not really too gruesome, but impactful enough. Okay scene. Uh, but it's such a cliche to kill the dog. Almost every dog dies in a horror movie, unless it's like one of the badass dogs from, uh, or unless it's like the badass dog from uh, The Hills Have Eyes, uh, either version, the remake or the original, or the movie Bad Moon, where that uh, dog keeps beating the shit out of the werewolf. Um, <laughs> unless it's one of those dogs like that, dog almost 99% of the time dies in a horror movie. And it's become to where it's like a running joke to kill a dog or a random animal or a pet in a horror movie now. But, uh, so, she starts going crazy, Mia does, uh, they can't get across the bridge, it's been washed out by a flood, uh, so they're stuck at the cabin, Mia starts going crazier, um, they end up having a, she, like, attacks the, uh, ex-girlfriend of the, of the brother in the movie, she vomits all over the girl's face, decent gore, blood flow, not bad, no, they throw her down in the cellar, lock her in there, one thing I cannot forgive is that no matter how horrible things get, the brother keeps saying, maybe she's just going crazy, my mom was crazy, maybe she's just, you know, acting crazy because she's, uh, you know, not getting, not on the drugs anymore. And I kept wanting to just punch him in the face as hard as I could, because that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard that any human being could possibly say, whether they're a character in a horror movie or not. Okay, uh, you just seen somebody like, okay, after she pukes on the ex-girlfriend's face, she got, that ex-girlfriend goes into the bathroom, starts cutting part of her face off, attacks the geeky guy, and he has to bash her in the head with a toilet. Uh, and then the guy's still like, and then the brother's still like, well, maybe it's just like some kind of crazy virus. And I'm like, oh my god, that is unforgivable. That is unforgivable. Unforgivable. But any, anyway, that level of stupidity is unforgivable. But anyway, um, as for Gore in the movie where the, the ex-girlfriend's cutting off her own face and everything, that's cool. Um, she starts stabbing the hell out of the geeky guy. With a with a freaking piece of glass, and I like how the stabbing's done. She's got it like one hand. She keeps like going down like that, kind of like a robot over and over while she's yelling. That's okay. She gets her head bashed in. That's cool. Um, she also stabbed the geeky guy in the face with a with a needle. He pulls like the end of the needle out of his eye, like right underneath his eyeball. That was cool. Uh, effective. Um, anything else? Um, another thing. Some of the characters behave really stupidly, like the the girlfriend of the brother. She goes into the cellar because it's open, and she thinks, because she hears Mia down there talking, she, she thinks, well, Mia must be okay now. I better go down there and check on her. And I'm like, that's unforgivable as well. That is completely unforgivable. But she goes down in there. She gets bit on the hand. And, of course, she has to saw her hand off because it starts uh, acting crazy. 
and it's hurting. So she saws her hand off, and then one thing leads to another, and now she's demon-possessed, and she starts shooting the hell out of the geeky guy with a nail gun and shoots the hell out of the brother with a nail gun as well. Uh, she gets ready to finish off the uh, brother. She beats him with a, with a fucking... Um, she beats him with a, a poker or something. I can't remember. It's been a day or two since I watched it. It was a poker or something or a piece of iron or something or whatever. Uh, but uh, she be she's beating the shot of him. The geeky guy's already had the shit beat out of him. Um, but he uh, but he saves the she, he he saves the brother. He distracts her. She comes over there, starts beating the hell out of him. She hits him right in the hand with the with the weapon, and it causes like his whole hand to like split, like his fingers and everything, like split down the middle. Uh, that was cool. Um, and then the brother like blows her away with a shotgun, uh, so she's dead. Finally, he snaps to his senses and decides to burn the place down. But as before he gets ready to burn it, uh, basically the person who's possessed has to be killed, uh, or the first person who's possessed by the creature has to be killed. And then if they're killed, then the creature just goes away and everything's fine, which is a pretty easy scapegoat, honestly. If you didn't really have any emotional attachment to the person, you could just kill them easy, and that'd be it, and it'd be over. But anyway, but the brother can't bring himself to kill his sister because he starts hearing her sing a song that her that their mom was singing in the hospital when she started going crazy or something like that, or she used to sing to him or whatever. So he pussies out and decides to uh, bury her instead. And so he buries her. Um, one thing that's kind of a little bit of a stretch, he buries her and then he, re he refibrillates her and brings her back to life, which I think is kind of neat, bringing the person back to life like that was possessed. Uh, that's kind of a neat idea. Uh, but I don't like how, uh, obviously, she's been cutting on herself and there's a scene in the movie where she takes a box cutter and cuts her tongue in half kind of like a snake look to it or whatever you want to call it i guess a, a serpent look snake look but uh he brings her back to life and all the wounds just like magically heal after she comes back to life that's stupid that was dumb um and kind of far-fetched for me to to accept even in a movie like this it's just too much of a coincidence that her whole body would just heal after the creature leaves her that's just a little bit too much but the uh, brother goes back in the house. The geeky guy's now possessed. Um, he pretty much, um, uh, well, he stabs the brother in the neck. The brother decides to blow up the cabin, so he dies blowing up the cabin, taking the the geeky the geeky possessed dude with him. So they're dead. Um, I kind of like how the I like how like a possessed person winds up being the hero by turning back to normal. That was kind of a neat idea, but I just don't like how like all the wounds healed and stuff like that. After she's unpossessed, that's kind of a little bit silly. But uh, Mia pretty much becomes the hero now. Well, she's the only one left. <laughs> it starts raining blood. The, this creature called the Abomination shows up, which is pretty much just an evil version of Mia. Not very creative with the look of it or anything. But um, it starts raining blood. Uh, it had it had to collect like five souls in the movie, so now it's able to rise from the from hell or whatever. And so it starts attacking Mia. You get some kind of neat scenes where it's chasing after her and it starts it like takes a machete and rams it to the side of a wall where she's hiding inside of a wall and like slices her leg and her arm. That was okay. The girl plays Mia. Uh, she's the best actor in the movie. She does fine. Um, she's still getting chased after by the abomination. Uh, it's coming after her. She gets the chainsaw, which we've all been waiting for to see the chainsaw used in the movie. She uses the chainsaw to cut the creature's legs off. Um, the creature f uh, flips the car over on top of Mia's arm. Uh, the creature starts coming towards Mia, and one li this made me, it made the film feel more like Evil Dead 2-ish right here, when the creature starts coming towards Mia, and he's like, and, and well, she's like, you're gonna die here, you, you uh, junkie, or whatever, something like that. You're gonna die here, you pathetic junkie, or something like that. Uh, that was a funny line, I thought that was funny, it gave me, gave the film more of an Evil Dead 2 feel, which is the superior film, uh, out of the three, in my opinion. Gave the film more of a feel of that which I enjoyed. She rips her hand loose and loses her hand. Well, she rips her arm loose, Mia does, and loses her hand in the process. Takes the chainsaw, cuts the creature completely in two, and then rips it up like through the creature's head. Uh, that was cool. Great gore effect. Um, but anytime they try to like give Mia a one-liner one -liner to make her seem more of like the equivalent to Ash from the first film, it just kind of comes off cheesy and doesn't, doesn't feel natural. The girl who plays Mia is the best actor in the movie, and her character is the most interesting, I would say. 
because of the stuff she goes through in the movie. But her, like, cheesy heroic lines or whatever, where she's like, I've had enough of this or something like that or whatever, just the way the actress says it or the way she, the lines she's given or whatever, just come off, come off as like an inferior, a slightly inferior version of Ash. But she's not bad. I wouldn't mind seeing a sequel with her as the hero in it again. Uh, or as, or as her in more of like a, a heroic style of the, of a character like Ash was in Evil Dead 2. I wouldn't mind that. Um, so, Pretty much that's the end of the movie. Mia's the only one left, and she's one handless, and the movie just ends. Um, just to give my final verdict for this film right here, I'd say, all in all, the uh, final saves it <coughs> from what would probably just be a decent movie, or an okay to decent movie. The final saves it. It's a lot of fun at the final with the raining bud and the creature getting solved in the half and all that. Um, the final brings it back up to about... I'd give it three stars of a possible four. It's a good movie. You can tell they really tried with this film to make a, a good remake or a good like companion piece to the original film. It's enjoyable. It's not like it's not bad or anything. It has no reason to exist. No, it doesn't need. It doesn't have any reason to exist. There's no reason this film should have been made other than money. And I know somebody's gonna say, "Well, all films are made for money." Yes, that's true, but <laughs> but most films are made with like the director. Or the crew, uh, well, the good films that are made are usually made from the director and the crew putting love and effort into it and want to actually make a good film as well as earn money. Remakes are just cash grabs, honestly. They're just cash grabs. Well, remakes of classic films that are already good to begin with, those are just cash grabs and they have no reason to exist. Uh, but you can tell at least this cash, this cash grab had effort and like, you know, love put into it. You can tell the director really tried to make a film that was like, would be at least a good companion piece to the original. And this film is good. It's one of the better remakes. It falls in line with like, the Fright Night remake as being good, but not, but not great. Uh, it's worth, it was worth watching in theaters. I had fun watching it in theaters. Except, when I watched it in theaters, there was these two dumbass teenagers who kept talking, and I wanted to pull some Evil Dead shit on them and take a chainsaw to their friggin' heads, cause they wouldn't shut the hell up. But other than that, <laughs> this is a good movie, and it was, that it was worth watching in theaters. But is it like is it like a replacement equivalent for Evil Dead 4? No, I would have much rather have had an Evil Dead 4 with Bruce Campbell coming back. But for what we got, it's good. But it's not great. It's good. It it'll be forgotten in years to come, except by horror movie fans. The original will like always be remembered. People will always love the original. But it's there and it's good. It's not bad. So I'll see you guys again with whatever my next review shall be.